Welcome to the Dream Boat. Remember, you can join the DRI for just £30 a year. You get access to more content, including videos and discounts for our events. It's a great way of finding out more about our work, joining our dream community, and supporting this podcast. Details in the show notes and at driccpe.org.uk forward slash membership. Welcome to the Dream Boat Podcast, a place where we talk about everything dreamy, all you wanted to know about dreams and where you might find some answers. My name is Dave Billington, and I'm a psychotherapist, and I'm also director of the Dream Research Institute. And I'm joined by fellow psychotherapist, Laura Payne. Hello, I'm Laura Payne, and I'm also part of the Dream Research Institute. And we're called the Dream Boat because we are actually recording our podcast on a beautiful canal barge here at Little Venice in London called the Boat Pod. We'll be looking at dreams, talking to guest experts, and answering your questions. Now, let's get on with the episode. We have spoken about lucid dreaming a few times in previous episodes, and we know that the ability to become aware in your dreams, to know you're dreaming, and consciously interact with your dream is really appealing to a lot of people. And for experienced lucid dreamers, at least some of them, the ability to live out endless fantasies gets tired pretty quickly and they start to use their lucid dreams to explore the nature of their minds, uh, their dreams, uh, the nature of consciousness and, and existence itself. And today we're going to talk to someone who has done exactly that and written about it and who teaches people who want to do the same. Yes, that's right. Today we have a very special guest on board the Dreamboat, Melinda Powell, who is one of the co-founders of our sponsor, the DRI Centre for Dream Studies. She's a psychotherapist and a teacher of dream work and the art of lucid dreaming and the author of two books, one including Lucid Surrender, The Alchemy of the Soul in Lucid Dreaming. Melinda has published and lectured widely about dreams and lucidity, and she is writing a new book called Dreams My Mother Taught Me, Lessons in Love, Light, and Lucid Dreaming from Beyond the Grave. So Melinda, welcome aboard the Dream Boat. Hi, thank you for that introduction. It, it's great to be with you both on this uh, next Dream Boat journey. <laughs> Excellent. It's so good to have you here. And, and um I will say that that in addition to your many accomplishments, um, you're also a a long term colleague and friend of mine, and we work together at the Help Counseling Center on Portobello Road in the the early 2010s. You were managing it. I was a, a trainee therapist, and uh, and then you brought me into the DRI in 2014, for which I'm I'm very grateful. I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about how the DRI came to be and, and why you and Nigel Hamilton founded it. Yes. Well, well, first, Dave, let me say that it's, it's great to know the DRI is in good hands, in your hands. And I think you've been directing it since 2019 or so. And uh, that's good. To, that's good to know. So thanks for that. And um, thanks for all you've done to develop the Institute and expand its reach through projects like the Dreamboat podcast and, uh, and Laura. Uh, it's wonderful to see this dream of yours and, and shared by us to, uh, to see it become a reality. So <laughs> thank you. Hats off. Yes, hats off to you. So um, I'd say that the DRI really came out of a, a deep uh, regard and love really for the transformative power of dreams i think nigel uh, hamilton with whom i co-founded it we each had had our own personal experiences of transformation through dreams and as psychotherapists and dream guides had witnessed that with our clients but at, at the time we were thinking about setting up the dream research institute i think that was 2011 or so and most of the dream research was really focusing on dream pathologies, like chronic nightmares or uh, hallucinatory aspects or parasomnias. And so there wasn't really actually a lot of evidence from a research perspective to say that 
therapeutic dream work supported well-being or was beneficial to well-being although i think as therapists and dream guides you know we've experienced it and we all we all believe that that's why we're here that's why we're passionate about dreams right so so um so we thought to, it was time to give to create a platform for looking at that connection between dreams and well-being really M much as has been or was done or and, and continues to be done for something like mindfulness Right, they're looking at it through the lens of well-being. So, so yeah, I think it came out of that, and also for me personally, I'd add the the weight of many hundreds of lucid dreams that I had once I started training at CCPE um, really put a longing in my heart to work uh, with dreams professionally. And also taught me that if you ask a question from a heartfelt place, very often uh, reality responds positively. So I thought, well, I thought I'd ask Nigel, had you thought about setting up a dream research institute? Because you've got this great foundation. You've got the CCPE, this training institute, it's uh, accredited, has an MA program. And he said, oh, yes, I've thought about something like that. And it sounds like it's a good time. So, so that's what we did. Yeah. And that sounds like a real application of you know, something you've learned from dreaming about, you know, asking mm -hmm. questions and them becoming reality and then doing mm -hmm. that in your waking life and, and having the, the same effect in some way. Would you see it in, in that way? Yes, I think it's 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 not even so much the question. It's how how it's asked, you know, where it where it comes from in us. And uh, it was really a, a deep, heartfelt place. Uh, so yes, I think that's that's that is I would say that about the dreams definitely. And, and you uh, you have a, a long history with lucid dreaming, as you've said. You know the the weight of these many many lucid dreams that, that you were aware of uh, that you were carrying, and um, I mean if I understand that goes back to childhood. So I'm I'm wondering about your earliest experiences of lucid dreaming. Yeah. I've it does go back to childhood because I was raised in a Baptist church. I went to Sunday school very, very young. Ever since I can remember, there were the stories of, you know, Joseph and his coat of many colors and uh, Daniel with his prophecies about dreams and describing dreams as thoughts of the heart. And I always thought of the Annunciation with Mary and Gabriel as a kind of dream or night vision. So I think it's fair to say I had a, I felt quite drawn by this. So I really had that attunement, we'd say, at CCPE for dreams. But um, I think uh, after some rather traumatic experiences early on in my childhood, I started having nightmares. And those nightmares were, were often, I would say, now lucid in the sense that I would wake up in the dream and find myself in this darkness that I was absolutely terrified of. And I was, I was literally, in any case, frightened of the dark and waking life. And I had a very powerful nightlight. So uh, a lot of my dream, uh, dream work has been learning how to trust, trust the darkness and trust uh, what it might hold. But in, in any case, it wasn't all, all, def all bad or frightening as a child. I think when I was about seven, I had a lucid dream I wrote it as a story for second grade about a prince and princess on a magic carpet that I called the Lunderbird, and uh, they go off to different places. Uh, but the teacher was quite confounded by the dream, and she called my mum in, and uh, <laughs> yeah, she questioned the origins of that and if I had actually written it and why was I writing such things. So I was really mortified, and after that I. I not only stopped sharing my dreams, but I, I stopped, um, I really stopped writing, which I didn't resume until late into my adult years. So, yeah. Well, that's very sad, isn't it? When a child like you, like your own child, you, you know, has such a powerful imagination. It's it's often, you know, through dreams that these things are explored. To have that cut off is in in that way feels really sad. Yeah, I hope hope some of the work that making a 
you know, the, having the dream education available through the DRI and, you know, all the work that, say, the International Association for the Study of Dreams is doing is that people are more comfortable with the subject of dreams and talking about dreams. So when children bring them up, maybe it's something that could be shared around the breakfast, you know, a table in the morning mm. to talk about dreams. And so, yes, but it, uh there wasn't that space when I was a child. So it wasn't really until I was older that um, in doing the training at CCPE, in fact, I started having the lucid dreams while allowing them to happen because I felt there was a, a context mm. and they were accepted and even welcome. So, Can you remember any of your uh, lucid dreams from that period? Are there any significant ones that you would like to yes. share? <laughs> yes, definitely. Um one that made a big impression was, a, well, I first should say there was a quote from Khalil Gibran, trust your dreams for in them you find the gate to eternity. Mm -hmm. And I had come across that quote on the training and I thought intuitive, intuitively that makes sense, but you know, let's try it out in a dream. And so what happened is I became lucid uh, enough in the dream which um, started with me driving a car in the California foothills where I grew up. And the car was going faster and faster and rather out of control. And I, I couldn't get a handle on it. I couldn't stop it. And then I, I became aware enough and I thought, well, uh, if I'm in a dream and I need to trust it, I'll just let go of the steering wheel and see what happens. Hmm. Um, so what happened is that the car roared into the side of a foothill and crashed oh. <laughs> and, uh, everything turned into a kind of light and then I found myself on what I later would describe as the lucid void mm. a kind of expanse of uh, darkness and uh, without any dream body just a just a kind of point of awareness if you will wondering where the heck I was <laughs> and I thought have I died? I thought maybe I've yeah. literally actually died. I was quite frightened. Uh, it took a little while to realize that actually I hadn't, I mean, I, would, I hadn't died. There wasn't anything menacing in the darkness, but uh, I did feel rather confused. And so unfortunately in that instance came out, uh, came out of lucidity and woke up. But I think I'd been introduced or initiated to the darkness in a different way. Yeah, I was struck by you saying how, you know, in this sort of adult lucid dream, the echoes of the fears of childhood, it sort of almost brutally put you back in there in some way, almost to deal with it this time around. Mm, that's right. <laughs> that's uh, the dreams meet us where we're at in a certain sense. I, I don't know. It's interesting you use the word brutally. I it um, didn't feel it, brutal at the time. <laughs> well, uh, it felt quite shocking. It's true. I think sometimes the impact is that's the waking up, you know, that's that's the, hey, pay attention, something's going on here. And I think um, also because I had the safety in waking life of the training, I felt there were people who could help in terms of dream guidance. So I wasn't alone in that sense. And one reason I, I do share about these experiences of the lucid void is because many times, you know, people who, who contact me have felt quite alone and quite shocked or frightened or thinking, am I going mad? You know, what is this? What's happening to me that I'm having these type of experiences? So just uh, helping them to, to feel uh, they're not alone in that process has been a, a big part of, of the work that I do and what I hope my sharing does. For people. I'm sure, yeah. And and to continue with that, um, could you say a little bit more about that experience of the lucid void? Is it always yeah. like that that first experience of you know being a disembodied point of consciousness in in a vast darkness, or are there other forms that that it, it takes as well? Well, it's interesting because the word disembodied. I mean, um, mm. there isn't a a dream body per se. But there is an awareness over time. I become more aware of the subtle body, okay. um, and the um, in which the senses are enhanced, really. And 
it feels quite intensely embodied and alive. So in a curious way, it helped me to become more embodied through that experience. Um, but what, it isn't the same every time, no, because I'm not the same every time. <laughs> and I think it responds to, to my state and uh, where my heart is and if, or if I'm in my head. But um, I suppose the challenge has been, my own way of approaching it has been that um, it's not, it's, it's not as if I'm making it happen. It's an invitation. And just like when we're in a guest in someone's house, we, you know, <laughs> we have a certain humility and, and wait for things to unfold. We don't take charge. So I think it's that, that notion. There's a, there's a, a quote from uh, a 12th century Sufi mystic. I expect you two might, will know that of him, Ibn Arabi, but uh, he said, uh, behold, I stand at the door of the divine presence, waiting patiently for what comes next. And I think um, that's the attitude at heart and mind that I uh, would wish or <laughs> to keep uh, in the lucid void. And then that uh, kind of creates a spaciousness for something new to emerge. So out of that, and maybe Ryan um, one of your other guests, Ryan Hurd, might have talked about uh, this idea of emergence, that spontaneous emergence, that then out of this void, that it's not really empty at all, that it begins to reveal itself it, as a um, presence, as having numinosity, as having being and intelligence, and then uh, perhaps uh, through life forms or light beings. So uh, one finds that it's not empty at all, it's quite full. Is this where, uh, you? I know in one of the books you've written, you talk about lucid surrender. Is this where the concept of lucid surrender emerges from for you? Yes, I, well, I don't know. The word concept makes me a little bit nervous. I'd probably say the, an attitude of heart and mind, really, in terms of approaching it. But... Um, I don't think I had, again, much choice in the matter because the numinous can be quite awe-inspiring. And uh, I think that was the proper reaction, was a kind of surrender in the sense of um, the French sense of or Spanish when you say, I, I was, it's almost, I was made to surrender. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, it was made to me. Yes. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Thanks, Laura. Yeah. So it's, it's what was demanded in the moment. But... I did have the actual expression lucid surrender came to me in a dream in yeah in the sense that um after one of these experiences on the void and uh, the luminous light forms I tumble back into a form based dream in which I'm in a cottage the fire's burning in the hearth and there's an old woman in a rocking chair and I'm curled up at the base of that um, on the rug resting after the experience and the woman the old woman says to me you know what are those what are those dreams what do you call those dreams when you allow yourself to be taken to God in that way and I say to her surrender lucid surrender and uh, so that was that that she repeated it and I thought yeah that's the term so oh. that's it, Laura. I think you asked that. Oh, yeah. what a beautiful dream. As you were saying it, I could see myself and you actually by that fireplace. It's such a powerful moment. Wow. Yeah. yeah. It's nice to share it again. Nice to remember it. <laughs> nice to feel it. Yeah, but that's where the, the expression came. And also, um, there's a, a lovely Zen teaching uh, on surrender. What's it? Um Give me a moment here. Oh, knowing how to yield is strength. No, use your inner light to return to the source of light. That is called practicing eternity. And uh, I really like that expression, uh, practicing eternity. But it's this notion that you find in religious tr or, or spiritual traditions of yielding or being receptive and um, surrendering. Um, even unto death, which unlocks a transformative power. You know, that's the idea of the 
the Christian idea of the uh, incarnation and the, the crucifixion, right? That leads to a resurrection. And so in a way, this lucid experience is a kind of mini death. It's a kind of dying to the kind of consciousness that we're normally used to. And so something new comes out of it. Yeah, we have to uh, be willing to to yield the mm -hmm. the preconceptions that we have and the attachments that we have in order to get beyond our limitations and become uh, or to realize that we are part of something something larger than we knew. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Yeah, as you said in your intro, people get a bit and it's quite intoxicating in the lucid dream initially, and it's it's also I think important to experience having that ability to change the dream and play with the dream in a certain way and um, feel that energy and create energy, lucid, lucidity. But um, then there's when we when we, as in waking life, we might start to wonder what what else is there? Is there something more? Yeah. So then something more is revealed. Yeah. And, and speaking of, of creativity, you, you'd mentioned about, you know, you, you had you wrote when you were a child and then you returned to that later in adult life. And uh, I'm wondering about the connection between the, the dreams and, and lucid dreaming and valuing that and, and how it inspired your written work. Yeah. All right. Thanks for asking. I think uh, it really could. In terms of just practicalities of writing at CCPE, you may recall we had to do a project um, and in our final year as part of the diploma. And I decided to do mine on using the waking dream process, which is the dream reentry process that um, Nigel's talking about on other podcasts, right? Uh, using that to develop lucidity, to, you know, to become to be, train ourselves up to become lucid in dreams through doing that process in, in waking life. And I wrote that up and then I, I did a lot of reading around it. And, and then I, I kept writing and I started the draft of a book. This was back in 2007, I think, or eight. And I, and I set it aside because I was working, as you mentioned, at this um counseling center is very demanding job directing that center as you know and and uh, so I set it aside and it wasn't until about 2010 I just I started writing for talks and presentations with this international association for the study of dreams so uh, when I prepared those talks I also wrote them up and Eventually, they asked me to write a chapter on lucid dreaming. Ryan Hurd, who, again, you interviewed, as it happens, I will just say to people on the same day. So that's one reason um, I'm thinking of him in particular. But Ryan, uh, thankfully, asked, he was editing this fantastic anthology on lucid dreaming with Kelly Boo Kelly. And he invited me to write about lucid surrender from a Jungian perspective. And I thought, wow, yes, I'd love to do that. And um, when I was doing it, for example, I actually had a dream where Jung showed up in an armchair. Opposite. <laughs> yeah, and chatted with me about ideas for the, the topic. Because it was interesting because the question is, you know, clearly some of his visions were... Uh, loose, you know, were essentially lucid dreams, but he doesn't use that term, and he downplays that. And uh, so the question is, why? Why didn't he talk about that more? Um, so it was interesting to to think about that and write about it. But eventually, anyway, all these talks and articles and whatnot um, added up over time, and had quite a body of material, and. Uh, as it happened in 2019, I was asked to write a book on dreams and well-being by Bonnier Books, and that became The Hidden Lives of Dreams, so just before the pandemic. That's right, yeah. That's right. And, um, and just to say, for people listening, um, you can find a, a link to that um, Lucid Dreaming anthology that Melinda mentioned on 
uh, the DRI website, as well as links for uh, Melinda's books. So there's The Hidden Lives of Dreams. And then um, the book Lucid Surrender. And um, maybe, Melinda, can you carry on and tell us about how how that book came about and, and maybe the dreams that uh, inspired it as well? You mentioned about the, the, the words Lucid Surrender coming through that one particular dream. W were there any others? Hmm. Yes, well, uh, after I started that chapter, I was told often in dreams to finish the book, finish the book. And I always thought it would be first about lucid dreaming, but then the opportunity for the hidden lives of dreams arose. Uh, and then after I finished the hidden lives of dreams, I thought, well, OK, I really must take these writings on lucid dreaming and put them together into a book. And I think because I got into a creative flow uh, and also because well, the dreams had become more insistent about it, there was a dream where I was told to um, by told by a creative dream figure. I was Bob Dylan, in fact. He said, yeah, he said, it's time to come away with me now. You're getting older now, and there isn't a lot of time left. And I thought, oh, what's going to happen? <laughs> Am I going to pass away, or what might it be? But I just think it was the time. It was the time, and it was before the pandemic. So the book, um, well, this was The Hidden Lives of Dreams, came out just when the lockdown started. And so it was there. Uh, and as you know, there was quite an interest in dreams and what did they call them? Pandemic dreams, right? So it's uh, there as, as a resource for, for the for people who the book found its way to, I hope. The Hidden Lives of Dreams really is a, a great resource for people who are interested in their dreams. And you, know, you cover uh, quite a lot in there about um, you know, ways of looking at one's dreams and how to work with your dreams and all the different kinds of dreams that, that people have. And um, it, it was inspired by many of your dreams. Is, is that the case? Yes. I mean, in Hidden Lives of Dreams, I do, I do refer to some of my own dreams, but I'm also looking at uh, dreams of people that I had worked with. And in Lucid Surrender, I'm really focusing in on the phenomen phenomenology of the experiences that I had. And what I mean by that is just the characteristics. So looking at the way light appears, the white, bright lights, or what I call the black light, and also experiences uh, like um, wormholes or portals, for example. And I was very interested in some of the dream imagery and how it developed over time, like um, mirror imagery, for example. As I, mirrors became a, rather a trigger for me for lucid dreaming, for example. Uh, I started to have dreams. I had a dream where words appeared to me written on a mirror or in mirror, in mirror writing because I was able to read the words. So I thought, well, you know, what's on the other side of the mirror, right? Just like in, I suppose, Alice in Wonderland. And then I I became aware of dreams as, as, sorry, as mirrors, as holding light, really reflecting back light and being uh, kind of in between space. And that's, that's an idea also at CCP of dreams as mirrors, into our inner world or into understanding our personal psychology or also in a window into the experience of the transpersonal or a higher consciousness, the divine will. So, but literally in the dreams then mirrors, when I noticed their beauty and uh, paused and became more attentive to, to, to them, then they, reveal themselves as portals and I very often was pulled through the mirror into the lucid experience or into the lucid void and, and it would develop from there. It sounds like it could be a frightening experience to be drawn through this this portal. Well again yes I think that's why I was I think probably the dreams uh, there's always a choice in a lucid dream right, to come out of the dream. Uh, 
And also, I think I had been trained up rather by the lucid dreams that preceded this one. So I was, as I said, open to allow that dream to unfold. And also, um, in some of those mirrors, as I you mentioned the new book and dreams my mother taught me, a, a few times I saw my mother in the mirror and she had passed away in 2001. So when I saw her in the mirror, I felt reassured. I felt safer, right? So I think then one aspect from a transpersonal perspective, of course, is that the dreams are increasing our capacity to contain challenging feelings, right? Um, and also to hold the unknown. And so I think alongside of this, I was uh, at that time of that dream I described, I was doing the psychotherapy training. So there was a parallel there in what I saw in the mirror, what was reflected back and um, the the challenges that I was learning to contain and also in my work life. So, mm, but, I, so just to say, sorry, Laura, that, that so that's an example of the kind of topic I'll ex explore in, that, in the book Lucid Surrender. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds like such a, a powerful combination of things coming together of of the the seeing your mother who had passed away and uh being able to hold the unknown and the frightening and to increase your capacity uh mm -hmm. and to be taken into uh, another form of reality or an, a, another view onto what is real and into consciousness and into yourself there's so many layers to to mm -hmm. those experiences yes i think well on the training when i had first had that lucid dream about the car that I mentioned. And I remember I was attending a lecture at CCPE and I asked Nigel Hamilton, you know, what do you do in a lucid dream or when you become lucid? It was new to me in the sense that I didn't realize it was a kind of studied phenomena, <laughs> but you know, it was new to me in that sense. And uh, he said, well, meditate. Um, for me, that meant take a, a prayerful, receptive stance and so often to maintain a balance in those experiences I would sing a sacred song or repeat a sacred name and that would help me keep my my focus and as a child and um, I'd gone on lots of very intense backpacking trips with my father um, we for example we climbed the highest mountain in the continental United States Mount Whitney I think four times before I was 16 and that was just one of many and I think what I did as a uh, in my youth then those trips were a little bit too much for me they were quite challenging and I would put myself into a kind of trance by singing those sacred songs and it transferred into the dream world quite nicely years later but I hadn't you know studied I hadn't intended that to happen it, it was a spontaneous response to what was happening to me in the dreams. I'm finding it lovely that you sort of really took on lucid dreaming while uh, you were training, and now here you are passing it on to other students through the courses that you run at the DRI. How, how do you actually teach lucidity to students? How do you encourage them to be lucid? Well, I First, Laura, thank you for that reflection. That's lovely having that mirrored back, that full circle quality. That's that's lovely. Thank you. Uh, I think just as I really learned on the training through at bringing attentiveness to dreams, uh, starting off with dream journals and giving time, as in it, it, one is relating to one's inner world and making space, making time, much as we would in waking life or a relationship with a human being. So there's that fundamental aspect. But um, using that waking dream part process, the dream re-entry really, uh, to develop that attentiveness and awareness that we then bring into the um, the dream space. So I mean, I well, it's probably a good place. That's it could be a good place for an example of what I mean. Yeah. I think I had, um, I've shared this dream in Hidden Lives of Dreams, but in the dream, I'm, 
at the sea. I'm right by a small river and I can see a rainbow trout in the water. The water is quite still and it's very clear. And at that time myself, I was undergoing the waking dream process. And I knew my therapist or dream guide would say, oh, you know, if you, if you can try to touch that fish or engage with that fish. And I think to myself, ah, that's what she would say. So that's what I'll give, I'll do, right? And that initiated lucidity for me. So it's, um, it's not a kind of five, five star, five step method, let's say. But I think really that kind of attentive, quality is fundamental to lucid dreaming and when we start engaging with our dreams that way uh, then lucidity is is really a natural outcome so it's called the waking dream process i'm sure for more than more more than one reason not just because we're awake when we do it right but also because we wake up to uh, a new awareness i was very struck by the um uh, the sort of tactile and sensual, sensate nature of you touching the fish. And I've often noticed this in lucid, my own lucid dreams, but, you know, when other people describe their lucid dreams, that often there is this sensate, an intense sensate moment that almost sort of punctures through the dream space and, as you say, wakes you up within the dream. Yes, absolutely. That's that um, quality of the subtle body where the senses can be actually intensified. Mm. And in teaching um, lucidity, is that one thing that you would encourage students to, to look for, a moment of a sensate moment almost within a dream that um, they should, could be encouraged to interact with in some way? Yes, I mean that that's an that's an excellent way in. I mean there are there are different ways in when one can notice incongruities in the dream, a bit like a matrix mm -hmm. moment. Mm -hmm. I think that as one becomes more familiar with the lucid experience, a trigger is often beauty, and that may be a sensual experience as you're describing, Laura. But um, for example. For me, a, a trigger is light itself, light, light on the edge of clouds or light in a window, or light in a crystal, and uh, seeing that as spirit <clears throat> in, in, my, in my own uh, symbol system, and that, that awakens me to lucidity. So I think that those deep sense, sense experiences are often connected to an expression of beauty whether it's through a scent or a touch or, a, you know, a more full, full awareness of the physicality. Again, I'm, I'm reminded of what you were saying about the, the connection between you know, dream revisitation with the waking dream process. And so much of what we encourage is uh, to, to connect the images to our sensate function, to, to connect via touch and via sensations in the body. Yeah, but, absolutely. But yes. also to, to sit with those experiences that when you connect to the, the essence or the, you know, the spiritual power of a dream and, you know, no, don't skip over it, be with it, take <laughs> it in fully. And it seems like if I understand from your experience that, you know, the more that you do that and the more that you do that in your waking reality and your revisitation, then the, the more that uh, gives you that awareness or that possibility of awareness to, to go into the lucid state. Yeah, that's very well put. Thank you, Dave. Yes. It changes us on a cellular level uh, in, in many, in, in some way. And, uh, and at some point, one doesn't have to be in a lucid dream to experience it. I think that's something I've learned from the dreams. I mean, I had many, many hundreds of dreams over a short period of time. <laughs> and at, at the end of that, I had a dream, a lucid dream, where I was told um, I wouldn't be having so many lucid dreams that it was time to wear my soul on the outside. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, well, lovely. I took that to mean sharing the dreams and writing about them 
them. I think, yes, I think that's what I notice now is what you what you're saying, Dave, is you just it becomes natural, it becomes part of our physicality to be aware of a more that's more subtle the depth <laughs> of the world around us. We carry that. And um, I feel that the presence of the void, however, one may want to define it as um, spirit or consciousness or presence, that it's it's there. You know, it's embracing us, even if we're not aware of it. But we have the opportunity in a lucid dream to experience it without having to go through something like a proper near-death experience, which is usually incredibly, you know, dramatic and damaging. <laughs> Um, or so <clears throat> it's it's something uh, it's a capacity that we we all have and i suppose they say statistically about <clears throat> excuse me half the population will have at least one lucid dream that they'll remember right so and the thing is that most people are so shocked and surprised they just come out of it so quickly <laughs> so the thing is if we're more aware of the possibilities uh, and that it is something natural, that it is part of our birthright as human beings, and they're helping us become more fully human, and they're, they're giving us a way to approach the numinous, you know, through the dreams. It's that approach that's important, and we know that as psychotherapists. So uh, if they know that, then they, they're more comfortable and can say, ah, oh, maybe I'll just... I can I can breathe. I can just feel safe in this space. This is something that happens to when you're a human being, <laughs> and you have a body, interestingly enough, and a brain because we yeah. need those to dream. <laughs> yes. No, that's that's wonderful. Thank you so so much for that. So, Melinda, you're obviously writing a new book called Dreams My Mother Taught Me, Lessons in Love, Light and Lucid Dreaming from Beyond the Grave. I was intrigued by the title. It's a really powerful title. You know, what, are, what are your thoughts about those who've died that then appear in our dreams? Yes, Laura, thank, thanks for asking that. I think um, in relation to what I've written, my own experience is that I wouldn't have thought it necessarily until I had had the experiences with my mother and lucid dreaming. But I really got the sense that love continues beyond the grave in a very active way in this in that um, the relationship can still deepen. And that sometimes the deceased person perhaps is making up for what they might might have happened in waking life or, you know, um, somehow influencing situations here on earth. But um, I mean, some people will say, oh, if a person who's died appears in a dream, that's just a projection of my dreaming mind and part of my personal psychology. And that may well have some truth, but also at the same time, there is that possibility that my mother or the deceased person is appearing um, in a subtle form, in a subtle body, from the other side, and uh, and so I think it's both both and in that case. Uh, if we just dismiss that, uh, we we lose an opportunity. Really, uh, uh, we lose an opportunity to to continue loving in mm -hmm. a deeper in a deeper way. Really, beyond beyond death. But um, yes, that's. That would be my response to that question. Well, it seems like it, it almost doesn't matter whether, uh, you know, you, you believe, one believes whether it's a projection or, or a visitation from the other side, but there's an opportunity to honor that experience of, of that person. And, mm -hmm. and, yeah, whether that's internal or external, it almost doesn't matter. It's still a beautiful opportunity. Yes, absolutely. And that's something I'd really like to emphasize in terms of lucid dreaming is that, you know, you don't have to be a lucid dreamer to have that sense of being lucid, right? There's other, in terms of brain states, very similar to meditate, meditative states or um, peak experiences, for example. Uh, even, even when people are making love and there's that sense of 
uh, union has very similar brain waves apparently <laughs> so um it's just that that's one particular form and it's the ex experiences are rather intensified so that can facilitate uh, especially when you're you're working with a guide it can facilitate both inner healing and development so yes Melinda, thank you. That was a really, really interesting answer to the to the question. Yeah. Yeah. You asked about how my experience of lucid dreaming had changed me. And there's a, a quote that came to mind uh, that I have in Hidden Lives of Dreams that Joseph Campbell found in a, an ancient Aztec manuscript. And it says that we come to earth to live is untrue. We come but to sleep and to dream. And I think it's that sense that um, working with dreams kind of flip your perspective a bit. They invite a different way of looking at things and that consideration of the reciprocity between dreams and waking life. So I did want to mention that. And it's a very evocative quote. There's a lot it in it. Is. Yes. Yeah, that's lovely. Well, thank you so much for that. And uh, we're, we're going to wrap up. We're out of time for today. Melinda's work can be found on melindapowelldreams.com. Uh, it's Melinda Powell with two L's, dreams.com. And uh, Melinda, you also facilitate um, the online courses for the DRI Center for Dream Studies. Um, there are courses starting in uh, January 2024. And um, you also have uh, webinars that you do and um, dream groups, and these are all things that people can find out about on your website. You have the Hidden Lives of Dreams webinar coming up in spring 2024? That's right, and then in the autumn, one on lucid dreaming. Excellent, okay. Um, so if you want to find out about the, the DRI courses that Melinda leads, uh, you can find out about that at driccpe.org.uk. Um, and for all of Melinda's other groups and masterclasses, there is information on the DRI website, but also she has a gorgeous website and very informative website at melindapowelldreams.com. It's really worth a visit. So Melinda, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to be with us today. We, we really appreciate it. And it's been wonderful to, to speak with you. Thank you. It's, it's, it's wonderful to speak with you. And I'm very happy to be on the dream boat. <laughs> it's been lovely having you on board. So anyway, sweet dreams. And keep dreaming and keep sharing your dreams. So thank you for joining us for this week's episode. Don't forget to like us and leave comments on your favourite podcast platform. As I'm sure you know, that's the way we build an audience for the Dreamboat podcast and also to spread news about dreaming. And as we said, there are many ways you can share your dreams at the DRI, the Dream Research Institute. Yes, we have courses, events and workshops and we want to hear from you. So check out the show notes for links or find us on Instagram and on our Facebook page and on our website at driccpe.org.uk. And if you want to explore your dreams further or you would like to support us, you can join the DRI as a member for just £30 a year. As a member, you will get discounts for all of our events and short courses. You'll get our newsletter with latest dream research news, and we'll also be adding other special member benefits during the year. Of course, members' dreams will always be given preference for reading on the podcast Dream of the Week slot. So go to the link on the show notes and become a DRI member today. Keep dreaming and keep sharing your dreams.